Hi, I wanted to review some of the material from the 26th of July. Um, first of all, we talked about uh, kind of recapping some of the stuff that Maya told us about um, in terms of uh, disease markers and also how machine learning can be used to um, identify um, com more complex interactions and subtypes of uh, different disorders. So first of all, just in terms of disease markers, um, the first study was uh, Bloomberg where they were looking at bipolar disorder versus controls, and there were a couple different studies in here. One um, was looking for areas with different size, and they found that the amygdala and hippocampus are on average smaller in patients with bipolar. Um, second, there's also more activity in the amygdala in bipolar patients as compared to controls. Um, one of the things that she emphasized is that um, is the idea that there are perhaps different subtypes within a disease. So there might be, um, for example, um, uh, something like what Bloomberg found, where there is something that is true for many or most people with um, bipolar disorder, in which case it's called a disease marker. Um, but there might be some things that are lost if we average a lot of the data across everybody. Um, and there may be situations where, for example, um, the average activity in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex is the same in patients with a particular disorder. Um, but maybe half of the people have um, overactive of one and underactive of the other and vice versa. So the average comes out to be no different. Um, but um, uh, but, um, but there are actually two different subtypes of the disease. Um, and this is, um, uh, in fact, um, one other thing that we can do with machine learning uh, in fMRI is look not just one area at a time, but look across many different areas. So um, there was a study about now not bipolar, but instead major depressive disorder um, by Drysdale, in which they looked at um, patients with major depressive disorder, just the sort of resting activity across many brain areas. And what they found is that there were four distinct groups of patients with 10 or 15 different areas that showed altered patterns of activity in one group. There was altered patterns of activity in the um, uh, um, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. In another group, there was altered patterns of activity in the posterior cingulate. In another group, there was altered activity in the anterior cingulate. Um, and so um, some of those changes might not even be detectable if we just average everybody together. And also, it indicates that there are really different, um, that, that a disease with the same symptoms might have very different biological changes. Drawing on this, um, the Abramovich study um, uh, looked to see, um, are there systematic differences between the brains of people, in this case, like back to bipolar disorder, um, who respond to lithium versus not? And so what they did is they just looked at people with bipolar disorder and subdivided them based on who did lithium work for versus who did lithium not work for. And what they found is that there were a few brain areas um, that had different sizes in the patients for whom lithium was effective as compared to those for whom lithium wasn't. Um, the, the way they interpreted that is to say that um, those areas are different and they actually predict what um, uh, risk somebody has for, uh, or re 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 how likely it is that somebody's going to respond to lithium. Um, there's an alternative interpretation, which is that maybe the lithium use actually does change the brain size. Um, that's not what they thought of, but that is, in fact, something that you should um, know about. The other thing that we talked about on Friday the 26th um, was returning to um, uh, the HPA axis, the uh, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland. So um, when, when somebody is stressed, the hypothalamus releases something called corticotrophic releasing hormone that activates the pituitary to release adrenal corticotrophic hormone, which then activates the adrenal glands, which release cortisol. That causes a body stress. That also causes um, feelings of stress in the brain. Um, and there's a positive feedback loop that on its own actually would keep turning this up where the amygdala gets activated by cortisol and then it in turn continues and further activates the hypothalamus. Fortunately, we all have negative feedback systems built in where cortisol directly binds to the hypothalamus and shuts down its production of CRH and also activates the hippocampus, which then inhibits the hypothalamus and further shuts down CRH. Um, in looking at... Um, uh, um, People with major depressive disorder, however, um, there's um, an interesting experiment which demonstrated that negative feedback doesn't work as effectively in people with major depressive disorder. So in this study, um, they um, had an artificial cortisol agonist called dexamethasone, which they delivered and injected into both major depressive patients and normal controls. Um, they didn't include psychiatric controls, although that would have been an interesting idea.
Um, and in this, first of all, in the control subjects, injecting dexamethasone causes a decrease in cortisol, um, which we can detect and which lasts for about a day. Um, major depressive patients also do have um, a bit of a decrease after cortisol injection, but not nearly as much as the controls. And so what that tells us is that either the negative feedback system is not working very well, or the positive feedback system is too strong in people with major depressive disorder. Um, in fact, actually, further later work has shown that it's mostly related to a, a, a deficit in the negative feedback system. And that's something that we'll be talking about when we talk about the hippocampus over the next couple of days. Um, switching gears now a little bit to talk about some other stuff in terms of synaptic compensation from today, which is um, July 28th, um, we talked about, for example, with agonists. So if you have a drug that is an agonist, like alcohol or benzodiazepines that act as agonists for GABA receptors, then initially they just turn on the GABA receptors and cause inhibition. Um, but after chronic use of weeks or months, um, especially at higher doses, you get fewer receptors. That makes the agonist less effective because there are fewer places for it to bind. And also, when the agonist is absent, then there's too little inhibition, and this leads to what are called withdrawal symptoms, um, where when the agonist is taken away, there are um, uh, unpleasant, and in the case of Valium or, benzo or, or uh, alcohol, um, even dangerous um, uh, effects of immediate removal of, um, of uh, especially after a long period of heavy use. Um, we talked about other drugs, for example, opioids that have something similar going on where they act as agonists at different receptors. And then we talked about antagonists, in particular um, adenosine, uh, um, and the, the adenosine receptor antagonist, uh, caffeine. Um, so caffeine is a adenosine receptor antagonist, and so um, unlike the agonists, which cause the removal of receptors, um, when you put in an antagonist, the cells compensate by putting in more receptors for the original neurotransmitter. So now there's more adenosine signal, um, and and it takes more caffeine to get a um, to get a, um, a response, um, and and, um, and then also when caffeine is taken away, then um, person will feel very tired. Um, we also discussed how transporter blockers are similar to agonists in that instead of now they're not stimulating the receptor directly, but instead there's getting more neurotransmitter, which is then going to mean more signal, which then the cell will respond to by removing again receptors. Um, we also briefly discussed the definition of major depressive episodes and a major depressive disorder, which is just two or more major depressive episodes, and then talked about um, norepinephrine um, receptors in major depressive disorders. So as a reminder, there are three types of norepinephrine receptors, the alpha-1 that are associated with G-other. Um, these have complicated effects in the cell, but for an organism, they tend to be feeling overwhelmed. Alpha-2 which um, tend to um, help you feel calm and focused um, uh, and are inhibitory at the cellular level, and then beta, which are excitatory at the cellular level and are more involved in sort of short-term responses rather than chronic stress or feeling overwhelmed. Um, it turns out that people with major depressive disorder have more alpha-1 receptors, at least before they're medicated, um, and that alpha-1s are just inherently a little bit more efficient at getting removed um, by these compensatory effects. So, um, if we um, have uh, um, unmedicated major depressive disorder patients versus controls, we, we expect to see more alpha-1 receptors in the patients with major depressive disorder. Um, if you give a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, um, then that will um, decrease both the alpha-1s and the alpha-2s, but again, the alpha-1s are faster and more efficient at getting removed, so that's going to change our ratio to be more similar to the controls. But this takes weeks to take effect, and um, and it takes weeks because compensation is slow, and those weeks can be very unpleasant in part because these, you're already having too much alpha-1 receptors, and now we're putting even more norepinephrine through them, which can make the symptoms worse rather than better. Um, there are a few other theories out there that also relate to this, some other things that we'll talk about when we talk about serotonin. Um, also, I just sort of briefly mentioned um, classes of drugs for major depressive disorder. Generally, these are drugs that either increase serotonin or norepinephrine or both, um, and typically take weeks, again, before they are effective at treating the disorder. We'll talk more about those, of course, in the coming class.